Good afternoon, friends. I think we'll get started. I've waited the customary two minutes past their starting time, and people will continue to trickle in. I'm Todd Anderson. I have the privilege of being the Dean of the Cumming School of Medicine, and I want to welcome you to this very special lecture. This is the Friesen International Lecture, and we have an incredible treat for you today, and we'll get to that in a minute. I want to start us off in a good way by acknowledging that the University of Calgary is on the traditional lands of the people of Treaty 7 that includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, that includes the Siksika, Gainai, and Pagani First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, that includes the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Districts 5 and 6, and we have the pleasure of living and thriving and playing on this land, and this is a small part of what we do for our commitment to truth and reconciliation. And we pay tribute to the traditional knowledge and land keepers that were the past, present, and future elders. This is a special day for us, and we are absolutely thrilled to uh, have uh, Dr. Buta here as our guest speaker. To say a little bit more, we'd like to acknowledge uh, the friends of the CIHR, and uh, Emeritus Professor Peter Lewis is going to start us off and tell us a little bit about the lecture uh, and the friends of CIHR. Peter, welcome. Uh, so thank you. Um, before I talk about the Friends of CIHR, I did want to say I'm so pleased to be here in Calgary. I actually emigrated from England to Calgary in 1958. I did my undergraduate honors chemistry degree at the University of Alberta at Calgary, which that year became University of Calgary. So I'm really thrilled to come back. I have um, spent now 50 years uh, as a professor of biochemistry at the University of Toronto. Uh, I retired in 2018, and now I'm taking on uh, various uh, volunteer activities, such as, in this case, since January, being the interim president of the Friends of CIHR. So I want to thank the University of Calgary on behalf of the Friends of CIHR for hosting the 2023 Friesen Prize Program and our honoree, Professor Zulfikar Buta. The Friesen Prize and the related events are organized by the Friends of CIHR, which is a national organization focused on the support of science in society. FCIHR advocate on behalf of young people as career scientists, and we've had the pleasure this morning of meeting some of those, and encouraging the funding health, funding of health research in Canada. We are supportive of the goals and ideals of CIHR and are eager to recruit young people to our activities across the country. We have a website, fcihr.ca, and you can actually sign up there to be a member of the Friends of CHR if you're interested. So this year, as you know, we're honoring uh, Dr. Zulfikar Buta, the 17th Henry Friesen Prize International Prize winner, who was selected for his exceptional contributions to the health and development of children around the world, and you're going to be hearing about that shortly. Now, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Friesen, who's uh, now retired at the University of Manitoba, uh, and the prize was founded in 2006 uh, to recognize his contributions to the creation of CIHR. Those of you, are, many of you are young and don't know this, but back before the year 2000, there was an agency called the Medical Research Council. And then in the year 2000, it transformed into Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And Dr. Henry Friesen was instrumental in making that happen. And in 2006, our, our uh, Charity, the Friends of CIHR, created a prize to recognize Henry Friesen's accomplishments and especially towards creation of CIHR. And so every year we award a prize, and Dr. Buta is the 2023 a prize uh, awardee, and we have a new one just coming out, which I'll just pitch to you here, and that the 2024 
uh, prize winner is Gordon Guyot, Professor Gordon Guyot from McMaster University, a very well-known scientist as well as Dr. Buta, and uh, will be hopefully back here sometime in around a year to uh, bring Gordon uh, here. So in addition to the events today in Calgary, Dr. Buddha has had a whirlwind tour through Ottawa University, University of Toronto, and the Global Health Day at McGill. So he will be completing his Friesen Prize programs with activities here in Calgary and next month in Winnipeg, uh, engaging senior, junior, and mid-career academics, students, and policy experts. So today, as I said, we celebrate the prize 2023 prize awardee, and we're very grateful for Dr. Buta for accepting the obligations inherent in the 2023 prize. A brief biography of Dr. Buta is provided in the announcement. You probably read it; gives you some background, and uh, uh, and I'll highlight. And, but he'll highlight that, or will be highlighting that in his long career where he's made innumerable seminal contributions to improving the lives of millions of people, both in Canada and around the world, from his life-saving work in the first 1,000 days of infants with respect to maternal child health initiatives related to nutrition, infection control, and public health. And, and at least as importantly, we got to know Dr. Buddha better during his tour in Ottawa and recognized him as a humble, compassionate man with insatiable scientific curiosity. At the same time, during the meetings with officials at the Health Canada, including the Assistant Deputy Minister of Health, we witnessed Dr. Buta's passionate and compelling advocacy for the urgent need for federal investments in Canadian science and scientists both now and for future generations. So he is an inspiring, as you'll see, um, and visionary scientist, clinician, teacher, and communicator. So again, Sophie, thank you for accepting the 2023 prize, and we look forward to your lecture, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, I could spend a very long time introducing Zulfi's accomplishments, but he's shaking his head, so I won't do that. Got to know a little bit about him at dinner last night. He is a clinician, neonatologist, continued to practice medicine until very recently. He has a PhD in nutrition, but his seminal work has really been in the advancement of global health for children. He was the founding director of global health uh, at the Aga Khan University Network, and then about a dozen or 15 years ago, became the founding uh, global health lead at Sick Kids uh, in Child uh, Global Health. He is an amazingly accomplished individual. In addition to his research and mentorship, uh, he is amongst the top 100 cited scientists in the world. And he is going to uh, tell you all about the great work that he's doing at the intersection of climate change, maternal and child global health, uh, from a perspective that he has that is unique to few individuals. And we're very proud that he's here today. Sophie, thank you very much. Well, thank you ever so much, Dean Anderson and, and Peter, for uh, this generous introduction, and also for the opportunity to come back to Calgary. I haven't been back here for a while, and uh, my last trip here was to speak about global child health in, in, uh, in a grand round. But this is a new area. It's an emerging area. And it's an area that few clinicians understand because it is contextually dependent upon where you're coming from in terms of its relevance to health, well-being, and families. So what I hope to do over the next 40 minutes or so is to try and cover, if I can, um, and if I can get this to work, um, the overall environment of climate change and health in the context of low and middle income countries, the epidemiology as we understand it. Uh, why should we be concerned about its impact in relation to women and children, particularly the interface of maternal and newborn health? and nutrition, 
And then importantly, I will spend maybe the latter half of my talk on what can be done. The big problem with climate change is it's such a macro issue that a lot of people get lost in just the diagnostic, in the epidemiology, risk factors, and its magnitude. And, and a lot of the effort that has been spent globally through all of these COP processes and consultations since the Paris summit have been around mitigation. And mitigation has its own trajectory and time and is extremely important, but it doesn't serve the purpose of what is happening to people as we speak. So I come from Pakistan, and the last two days, the average temperature in the province of Sindh, where we work in many cities, has been 50 degrees centigrade and above. And you just need to imagine what it is like working, living, and growing up in that kind of an environmental condition. Schools have been closed the last one week in parts of Punjab in Pakistan and also in northern India. And you can imagine what happens to children when schools are closed. We have the recent memory of what happened in COVID. So the impacts of climate on the lives and livelihoods of families and children are being recognized in a variety of ways. So to this audience of believers, perhaps, I don't need to spend time on why climate change is real. But I have spoken in audiences where people have questioned the entire premise of the trends, the global epidemiology of, of global warming as being something which we've always had. No, it's not the case. And as you can see from the graphics here, the simulation and observation of climate change in terms of global warming over the last several decades has been far beyond what the secular trends and projections were like. Last year did turn out to be the hottest year in living memory. And this year might well break the records just from the, from the experience of the first half of the year. And it's not just in the usual geographies of South Asia and elsewhere where we have noticed the impact of climate change, but just in regions which have never witnessed this kind of temperature before. In the first a quarter of this year, North Africa had record heat recorded with many of these regions experiencing average environmental temperature <coughs> excess of 40 degrees centigrade for weeks and weeks. So this is not only real, this is an issue that people are learning to live with. But few people recognize that the impact of climate change is not just on the impact of extreme heat and extreme heat events but it's also on what is changing in terms of weather patterns and notably around precipitation. So you will note from the IPCC's report that patterns of rainfall, the traditional direction of things like monsoons that we've recognized at least in South Asia, are also changing and changing faster than people can react to. This year alone, within the last one month, we've had record floods in parts of Brazil that people hadn't seen in recent memory. Afghanistan, a country where I know very well and work, has had floods of the kind that they've never witnessed before. And it's displaced millions, it's killed hundreds, and it has been largely attributed to climate change rather than just happenstance. And in recent memory, people might recall what happened in Pakistan in August 2022 after several weeks of record heat where average temperature was in excess of 40 degrees centigrade in various districts of the country, weeks on end, we had something that we never witnessed before. The monsoons entering the country, not from the traditional pathway of the north, but they entered from the south. And the entire meteorological department, people whose business is to predict and forecast, just didn't see it coming. And these biblical floods that we had in the country, a country of nearly 230 million people, actually displaced and affected around 30 million people. We wrote about it, I published the numbers in the Lancet, close to around 16 million children were affected, about half of all people affected. Of the 1,700 people or so who died within the first week or so of the floods, roughly about a third were children because women and children are amongst the most vulnerable. They generally have the least ability in terms of withstanding some of these 
disasters when they happen in relation to climate. And therefore, it's not too surprising that major victims of floods in Pakistan in 2022 were indeed women and children. But they were indirect effects of the floods also, such as destruction of infrastructure, educational institutions. And if you look at what impact persisted after those first few months and look at what was the situation a year after the floods, you will note three things. One, less than half of the infrastructure was standing a year after the floods. Nothing was rebuilt, could not be rebuilt. Only a fraction of the reconstruction funds arrived. And of the children who were out of school, only about a quarter went back to school in that period of time. So the consequences of climate change and some of the disasters and impact of that are not only myriad, but they're also long-lasting. The other big element around climate change and some of these crises are that we are indeed looking at climate change being a threat multiplier. And let me explain what I mean by this. Few people realize that climate change and its impact is very closely related to many of the conflicts that we see in various parts of the world. How many people in this audience would recognize that the Darfur conflict in south of Sudan, something that absolutely destroyed that country and is still ongoing, was all about water resources and access to underground water. How many people in the audience would recall that the Syrian conflict that started in the Middle East started because of clash over water distribution and stoppage to a major city in Syria? So this issue of climate conflict, population displacement, is inexorably interrelated. And you can see this without getting into a lot of epidemiology and stats through just the distribution of what we call these risk factors. So if you take the world's map of climate change vulnerability, as you see over here, with a lot of the countries and populations at risk being in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, and if I was to overlay on this map the map of conflict, battle-related deaths, where the hotspots are, you can see a very clear homology. And then if I throw on top of that the problem that we see with health system vulnerability to outbreaks and pandemics, you again see it's the same regions which are least prepared for some outbreaks. And let me throw another element in, which is the cost of living or economic crisis that we see particularly exacerbated by Ukraine and what has happened after COVID, again, is the similar geographies. So put all of this together and you try and look at which are the countries that have all of these risk factors together, particularly climate change, and what global burden of disease or mortality for women and children is clustered in these countries. And the figure is mind boggling. 40% of the entire global burden of child mortality of the entire global burden of maternal mortality, of stillbirths, is clustered in the countries that are affected by these polycrises. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, this is a problem of low and middle income countries. This is a problem of geographies and populations that have the least resilience, the least ability to withstand and confront this. And they cannot wait for the world to get its act together on reducing carbon emissions and, and on reducing some of the risk factors associated with global warming. So let's explore for a minute as to how does climate change impact health and nutrition. And to understand this, you have to see how the context of rising temperatures, some of the issues that emerge from disasters and consequences, then relate to disruptions in the ecosystem the environment, air pollution, increases in vector concentration, and then the actual illnesses that you see in front of you. So therefore, the impact of climate on health, nutrition, and other outcomes can be through both direct and indirect pathways. Indirect pathways that come through the crises that you see here and the direct pathways that you see outlined over here. But none of these can make an impact on a population that does not have some of the social determinants and drivers of ill health. 
So a big modulator of the effects of climate change on health and status of the populations are what we call the social dynamics in the middle. And these social dynamics are pre-existing conditions, extreme poverty, gender inequality, environmental conditions, conflict, as I've mentioned. So we see that these social multipliers or effect multipliers are therefore a major intermediate pathway between whether it's heat or disasters or indeed even also extreme cold events impacting population and health outcomes that you see outlined over here. So to the students in the audience, if you want to read two documents on the impact of climate change on health of women and children, read these two documents. This report that we produced last year from the WHO on the effect of climate change on women and children's health. And this encompasses not only some of the theoretical underpinnings and framework, but also what are some of the mitigation and, and adaptation resilience strategies. And the other one is a qualitative report from Pakistan after the floods and the impact that these had on women and children in that setting. But I want to talk about the interconnections of climate change and maternal child health in a more scientific manner for people to understand why we are concerned about this. So the first point to drive home is that many of the impacts of climate change on the health of women and children actually start even before they are born. And to people who work with maternal newborn medicine or perinatal health and recognize that a baby is already nine months old before he or she is born, you can well imagine that the environmental impacts of climate can impact pregnancy and also the preconceptional period in manners that we don't understand very clearly. And the impact is thought to be variable across different stages of pregnancy. So there are some things that we recognize would be quite impactful if they were very early in pregnancy, first trimester, and as many people recognize some of the risk factors associated with the preterm birth are towards the latter end of pregnancy, are around environmental and heat exposures that typically happen late in pregnancy. And to my utter surprise, while we know a fair bit about this from the animal kingdom and the recognition of all of this through the dairy industry and others, human studies on understanding the biology and mechanisms on this are at a very primitive stage. Last December, I held a major national symposium bringing all the leading Canadian scientists and North American scientists together to explore some of the biology and mechanisms of how does climate change and heat impact uh, uh, health outcomes for women and children. And we could not get even simple answers to questions. What is the impact of extreme heat on things like epigenetics, on the microbiome? What does the confluence of extreme heat and air pollution do to health and developmental outcomes? And at what critical stages of pregnancy? So there is enough opportunity here for scientific research, which will not only inform what happens in Canada when you are exposed to environmental risks and, and wildfires or extreme heat, but also how does this relate to our global understanding of biology. But we do know, if, know a few things, and I will very quickly illustrate them. For example, we know that there is complete overwhelming of thermoregulatory mechanisms if you are exposed to extreme heat and therefore increased risk of preterm births. This has been shown, as you can see in these studies, across the world. I mean, most of these studies are actually from high-income settings. And this impact of heat exposure at critical stages of pregnancy is well recognized in terms of increasing the propensity for preterm births. Now, we had very limited data on this from low- and middle-income countries. So some of the information that's coming out of this is from retrospective cohorts where people have looked at data sets and people have tried to correlate with the information that we have from remote sensing on temperatures and, and on, on environmental conditions. So here is a study of 14 low- and middle-income countries across Africa and parts of South Southeast Asia looking at what happens when you have increased exposure to environmental temperature. 
And you will notice, if you can see the slide clearly, that it has two things. It has maximum temperature and it has diurnal temperature. Diurnal temperature would be the difference between the daytime and the nighttime temperature. And it is very important because that's where most of the cooling takes place. So if the difference between the daytime and nighttime temperature is minimal, then you can imagine that exposure to heat is almost constant. And not only people do realize this, but we also realize the consequences of heat being constant. And you can see very clearly here that if you do not have that diurnal variation, that your risk of prematurity is significantly higher across these studies. And so is also the case of stillbirths, something that we don't recognize very well, that with high temperatures, stillbirth rates go up. And most of these stillbirths are towards the latter side of pregnancy. Is they are not necessarily intrapartum stillbirths, but they are late pregnancy stillbirths. But let's see for a moment if any of these effects are modulated by what I call the social drivers, social determinants of health. And I'll give you two examples here from recent studies. The first is from our own backyard here, neighborhood. This is a study in Boston. And again, it tells you that the types of heat exposure and what is extreme heat for one population may be different from extreme heat in another population. Now, you wouldn't get a temperature of 50 degrees centigrade in Boston, but I tell you, the moment it crosses 30, it becomes in uncomfortable. So this is from the famous Boston um, Children's Health Watch cohort, where the investigators looked at the impact of rising temperatures that you see over here by gestation and what happened to low birth weight and, and, and uh, prematurity. On the top, you have women who had a reasonable home and a shelter. And at the bottom, uh, so is the other way around. At the bottom are women who are not homeless. At the top are women who were homeless. And most of the impact on reducing birth weight was seen in women who were homeless did not have a shelter, and therefore their exposure was a lot more. So it depends upon conditions, living, working conditions. And you see this very clearly from the data that have emerged from India, from this large study just published very recently. These are data from Tamil Nadu, from Chennai, actually, where they recruited a cohort of working women in different types of occupations and studied them in two time blocks from 2017 onwards. And the study showed very clearly that there was not only a higher risk of miscarriage with exposure, there was higher risk of small gestational age births and higher risk of being born low birth weight. And this was particularly notable in the subgroup that had higher exposure during their occupation. People, women who were working in the fields or were working outdoors. So certainly a combination of this is one of the reasons why many women in low- and middle-income countries who work either for a living with exposure or have tasks that are disproportionately distributed as, as work that women do places them also at a higher risk of exposure to climate change. We have some examples from recent studies of why is this so important in relation to timing of pregnancy. <coughs> So I'm sharing this particular study from my own institution. Nancy Krebs and, and Karthik Shankar led the study from, from Denver along with local colleagues looking at a retrospective data set on the relationship with heat exposure and birth outcomes. So in a nutshell, to summarize, they looked at the, the number of days that people were exposed, that women were exposed to environmental temperature of more than 39 degrees centigrade for days at end, and they particularly tried to relate that to this duration of pregnancy, stage of pregnancy. And what did they find? They found very clearly that if the exposure was in early trimester, first trimester, early pregnancy, these births were associated with a lower length at birth, and more worryingly, a smaller head circumference at birth. I don't have to tell this audience of people work with children, that what does all of that mean for development? It really certainly raises alarm bells in terms of what these children were like who were growth retarded in utero because their mothers had been exposed to high environmental temperature in the early trimester of pregnancy. 
and, and they looked at a number. They could not identify biomarkers from this retrospective study because none of those were collected in, in the manner that should have informed people. But they found something very interesting, which I think brings me to the nutrition angle. They found that women who had received a supplement of multiple micronutrients were actually protected from this adverse effect of reduced length and reduced growth. So there is some suggestion there that some of the costs of high environmental exposure in pregnancy could also be modulated through what happens to women's nutritional intake, maybe fluid intake, maybe hydration, maybe metabolism at that, at that level. Now, let me very quickly talk about nutrition and, and climate change. We look at nutrition through the lens and climate change through the lens of largely food production. The angle that I've just told you in terms of exposures to extreme heat events at different stages. And there is no question that if you have extreme temperatures, generally agriculture productivity in stable environment goes down. And this, these are data from California showing that if you have extreme heat events, agriculture production does indeed go down. We also know that extreme heat exposure also reduces the micronutrient content of crops, particularly C3 crops, grains like rice, wheat, maize, and their zinc concentration and iron concentration drops because there is an adaptive process when you have extreme heat and perhaps some reduction in subsoil water. In Africa, people have looked at the impact of heat exposure in retrospective demographic health surveys and linear growth and came out with modeled estimations to say that with each two degree centigrade rise in environmental temperature, there was a 7% increase in the prevalence of stunting. That seemed huge. And that seemed implausible also in some ways, just given the fact that that's such a massive impact that you would probably see a differential by just geoecology of temperatures in Africa. But we had an occasion to look at this in Pakistan recently, because my group has done serial nutrition surveys, and we have granular information on geospatial patterns of stunting. And we do know that there is a very close relationship between maternal malnutrition with low BMI women being clustered disproportionately towards the south of the country. And if you were to overlay on this map a map of wasting and stunting in children, there is tremendous homology. We were able to analyze data in terms of temperature change over the last decade, since there were two serial data sets, 2011 to 18, and see what was the pattern of temperature change by subnational geographies. And not too surprisingly, the bulk of the increase in environmental temperatures also towards the south of the country. And you also see pat patterns which were similar in terms of distribution of subsoil water. Now, while we were not able to correlate, largely because the data are so lousy, agriculture production data and food security data with some of this, but when you look at a multivariate analysis of what drives stunting in Pakistan, taking all of these variables into account, you begin to see an effect of not just acute change in heat, but actually a chronic exposure effect by some of these drivers related to environmental temperature as well. So while the usual suspects are there, that if you have economic gains, you have education, improvement in food security and urbanicity, your linear growth improves but you also have a reduction in linear growth if you are concomitantly also exposed to higher environmental temperature. And that's probably one important reason, maybe not the only reason, why stunting is so clustered towards the south of the country, because that's where extreme weather conditions are. So this is not all that climate change or heat exposure does. If you look at the health impact what people are beginning to worry about, and this is my last set of kind of epidemiology in this, are the effects that we are beginning to see on not just physical health, cardiovascular disease, but mental health. So not only people with pre-existing mental conditions at greater risk of adverse outcomes, but children, women, and particularly poor families have a much greater clustering of mental health impacts of climate change. And particularly if they are associated with disasters and consequences like flooding. So these are data from the IFRC 
estimates of various pathways through which how climate change and particularly flooding can impact mental health through displacement, very similar to what happens with conflict and what, what happens with particularly confluence of some of these risks. But you can well imagine that if you already have high prevalence of things like gender disparity, inequality, gender-based violence, then how exposures of this nature can exacerbate this. And to this particular audience, there is one more element of climate change and mental health that you should be aware of. In fact, it has led to the emergence of a new terminology for something that we recognize in young people, adolescent school-age children, on what we call climate anxiety or solastalgia. So solastalgia, I wasn't aware, is a term that is now being used for people who have this foreboding of their future being not only dark, bleak, but perhaps a sense of hopelessness in terms of change. And this is a generation that is witnessing change in front of their eyes. So for me, the interest was to see in this particular study the prevalence of this particular manifestation across the world through countries that were not only just high-income countries, but also including many low-income countries. So about a quarter of all children, adolescents, expressed extreme anxiety related to climate. So I rest my case on why this is important and why this is important to pediatricians and why we are making the case that all trainees in pediatric programs, wherever they are, need to have, just like they did in the millennium period, an understanding of global child survival, global child health, that they need to also have an understanding of how does climate change and environmental health impact outcomes. Because no country in the world is going to be protected from this in one shape or form. So let's look at what can be done. And, and in understanding this, there are two broad domains to understand how people are approaching this. I've already spoken to you about mitigation, which largely looks at reducing emissions, reducing carbon footprint, carbon capture, changing of technologies, net zero emissions from institutions. Extremely important. But I'm not going to talk about this because that has its own time frame and cost. But I'm going to talk about resilience and adaptation, things that need to be done in the medium to short term to help prepare families cope with what they are looking at every day. So we started to look at this in partnership with IDRC and, and, the, and the tri-agencies some two years ago by first doing a global gap map to try and see what evidence was out there, both from low- and middle-income countries, uh, in terms of what was known about associations between climate change and various health outcomes. And this traffic lights show you when there is green, there is reasonable, adequate evidence. Amber means some, and red means that it's really minuscule. So there is a lot which is known around impact of climate change on infectious diseases, on chronic conditions, and also to some extent on pregnancy and birth outcomes, although there's a lot more amber there. But you will notice that for certain areas that I've actually spoken about, occupational exposure, very little known from low- and middle-income countries in particular around consequences and also risk factors. Now let's turn to interventions, which was my major area of interest. How many do we know about interventions in various spaces? And to our utter surprise, this is a lot more red and amber, very few greens in here. There is very little research, very little guidance around what interventions would make a difference that I could tell a policymaker, do this and you'll have a 30% impact or a 40% impact in a particular geography because those studies have not taken place. But there are conceptual frameworks, and there is at least this theoretical understanding of how we might approach things at a community level in terms of trying to alleviate some of the risks and promote resilience and adaptation in population. And they relate to things that can be done at an individual level and things that can be done both at a community level and also through structural adaptation. And I'm going to try and go through this very quickly. So what about the health sector? So a lot of work on the health sector for climate change relates to the kind of activities within the health sector 
that relate to the health system promotion of resilience. And they relate to investments, training of health workers around how to deal with climate emergencies, heat stroke, heat exhaustion, um, surveillance systems, and importantly, also energy sources. So a lot of effort, and the Aga Khan Development Network has actually been at the forefront of trying to not only develop a tool, but implement it on calculating carbon footprint and, and outputs and how to get to net zero. But what is not there in the health system right now is what to do with things go south. And things do go south with climate emergencies. And I'm going to give you some actual examples of how that has happened in Pakistan. So this is from our recent multi-district, multi-provincial work on, uh, in Pakistan from district health information systems, real-time data on what help happens to various coverage of interventions in different stages. And you can see that during COVID, all of these antenatal care visits went down at different stages. And you'll also see that what happened with floods in Pakistan in provinces with the similar kind of dip in terms of people just not being able to access services or services not being available. And you see this for condition after condition after condition, both postnatal care, uh, late antenatal care in facilities, and importantly also childbirths. So we were confronted with this right after the Pakistan floods with a disruption of the health services, with displacement of the populations, lack of access in terms of communication and transport as to what could be done in the short term. And it took us a few months to get our act together, but we undertook one of the first, perhaps, cluster randomized trials of trying to do something in that situation which was simple, low cost, but could also potentially impact newborn outcomes and, and mortality. So this cluster randomized trial was to try and see if we could undertake a community-based approach of handling, handing a technology to family members that could not only impact maternal health, but also newborn outcomes. So this was focused on delivering clean birth kits in a circumstance when people were displaced and they required this in health system. This was done through the already existing community health workers, the Lady Health Workers Program, in Sen. And it's, this cluster randomized trial was undertaken in two of the most affected districts of Sen. Now, clean delivery kits to many people in the audience are no rocket science. I mean, they are built and, and, and designed to provide clean sheets, cord care, and, and, and uh, a mechanism to wash your hands. Soap, in this particular instance. We enhanced that kit in the intervention group by the addition of two simple things. The addition of chlorhexidine to clean the cord and sunflower oil to promote skin hygiene and care in a circumstance where we knew these babies were at greater risk of infection. And we also provided a blanket even though it was the middle of the summer. And the results were most interesting. We could not reach the entire sample size just because, you know, people are as people are. In cluster randomized trials, you can focus on the approach, but you don't really have any influence on the recruitment. But this was implemented with independent data collection. And a large distribution of the population was similar to what we see in regular health systems, with 84% of the women being multigravitous in this particular state. So yes, they used it. Uh, they used chlorhexidine, and they also used the oil to massage the newborn. They used the blankets, but they also continued to use other things. So community practices remained, but they used these additional things, as you could see over here. So we wanted to look at health and mortality, morbidity outcomes. And there was just a signal that complications during pregnancy and after delivery were slightly lower in the intervention group, although these differences did not reach significance. We were interested in looking at hard outcomes, even though our sample size was lower than what we anticipated. And what we found was that there was a significant impact on perinatal mortality, stillbirths. And I could not understand this data as I've often wondered as to how these community strategies can impact an outcome like this until the penny dropped that actually this intervention and what had happened with this interaction with the families 
also led to a higher use of facility births and skilled births in this particular community. And that was probably the lever that reduced perinatal mortality. So yes, you can do things in those circumstances with limited resources, provided you are focused on reaching those who are most affected by some of these impacts of climate change. There are other structural innovations that are important, and it's important to underscore them. And one of those relates to urban slums. And urban slums are a major target in a lot of this activity. Why? Because they are at particular risk of adverse outcomes, given the congestion, the limited settlements, tin roofs, and those that become ovens in the summers. And you can get a sense of that from the distribution of deaths in many, many places. In 2015, when we had an extreme heat event in Karachi, there were 1,500 deaths within 24 hours. And the vast majority of those deaths were clustered in these few urban slum populations where you can see those living conditions, uh, uh, you know, created the environment for adverse outcomes. Now, what can be done in that kind of a situation? So a lot of people who are experimenting with structural innovations, such as reflective paints, and these can be done mechanically, and they can also be done through cash transfers to families, giving them the support and materials for them to paint their own roofs and, and, uh, and uh, uh, houses that way. You can also do this through construction material, which are low cost, but sometimes those are also not affordable by population. So if you look at what happened in Ahmedabad in India, where they compared the impact of reflective paints on inner temperature within their household, and they also used different materials, in both of those instances, the impact on temperature inside the house was about two or three degrees centigrade reduction compared to ambient temperature. And there are other things that can be done, which in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through. But one of those is green roofing. Green roofs or just reducing the impact of reflected heat are things that can be done in any environment. And the global evidence around this in terms of making a difference is pretty strong. We believe that this can certainly reduce temperature by close to around 10% in any circumstance. And, uh, and this is now from a variety of settings. We've been working on some of this in rural Sen in partnership with architects. This is Jasmine Lari, who actually won an award last year, the, the Queen's Award, for designing houses and structures which are not only climate resilient in terms of the impact of the environmental temperature, but also could withstand floods and, and other emergencies. And you see the nature of the roof here. It's a thatched roof. Many indigenous populations here have it for a different purpose. But in this particular instance, it has a propensity to reduce indoor temperature. I do want to talk about the other structural interventions, which relate to gender-based risks. I've spoken already about why women, in particular circumstances, bear the brunt of climate change. Women bring water in most rural areas in South Asia and parts of Africa. They bring most of the firewood. They cannot do this when it's dark. They typically do this when they can either go as groups or individually without risk. The same is true for women using, particularly who don't have toilet facilities, using the fields. You know, they are restricted from evening activity. And that's one of the reasons why when the environmental temperature is high, we find some of the people who are exposed to it most are actually women, both in household settings and also in, in occupations of this kind. So addressing these gender dimensions of heat risk and exposure is something which is very close to our heart and something that we are trying to implement in, in communities or at least in the studies that I'm involved in. And what does that mean? Which means that in these communities, advocacy and working through men's and women's groups could mean that the water procurement part of activities during the summers could be a shared activity, could be something that men can do also readily without exposing a lot of women to that task. Which also means that in the health system, that you could arrange things during the hottest months of the year so that women don't have to go individually for antenatal care, that they could partake of group antenatal care at times when transportation can be assured and the health system is prepared for them in, in a manner that reduces their risk of exposure. So some of these things are not rocket science. They can be done 
but they need to require systematic thinking around this. The mental health part of this is something that we really want to scale up, and we are in the middle of a, uh, an intervention study funded by Grand Challenges Canada, which is trying to look at the impact of community health workers being able to diagnose and manage some of these at first level care and refer them where things are more than just mild. And the impact of many of these <coughs> mental health interventions from the systematic review that we have seen, even though it may be complex in terms of the tools used, are all positive. I have never seen a systematic evidence collated for interventions where the impact in these populations of reducing climate-related stress or climate-related depression is almost universally positive. So you can see most of these effect point estimates are on the side of, of gains and improvement. And this can be done with community health workers, sometimes using tools or job aids uh, that can be easily implemented. And this particular intervention in Pakistan which is currently a feasible study, is using one of those handheld devices called mHealth. Now, can we integrate this? Let me finish by just talking about doing things together. Can we bring all of these together? And the answer to that is yet. We could, and we actually should, because there is not the space in this kind of a complex environment of singular studies or single interventions. You can do them from a research point of view, but it would be only tackling a small part of the problem. So we've been trying, and with Welcome Trust, we are actually implementing a heat adaptation study. In, uh, it's a, a, a three-phase study in which the third part is a cluster randomized trial in both urban and rural settings of a combination of a community education and outreach program, personal cooling interventions through community support and health workers, and importantly, a participatory community structural modification of housing and living conditions in those environments to help reduce some of the effects of climate change. That includes green roofing and also the provision of, of adequate shelter in those populations. This urban study location in Karachi is pretty typical. You can see that we have very limited capacity here to change structures. But in the rural population, this is probably more going to be more likely. And it's being done through low-cost technology and low-cost approaches such as community mobilizers using community volunteers and also the Lady Health Workers Program of the government. So, ladies and gentlemen, I could have gone on for this for a very long time, but there is a recognition that we all need to make. I'm talking about the future, and I'm talking about the future of our children. For those who are born today or in this particular decade, if we don't do anything, and if we don't have mitigation and resilience adaptation strategies put in place, their likelihood of growing up in a world that is both unlivable in places and also has huge challenges of development and nutrition is going to be far greater than any of us can imagine right now. All of the modeling estimates tell us that it's not just the housing crisis of today, it's the environmental crisis of tomorrow that we need to be worried about. Now, we may be, you may be protected from some of the concepts that I'm talking about for extreme heat here in, in Calgary, but I can tell you that if I was giving this talk in, in Karachi or in Mumbai, people would readily understand what I'm talking about because they see it in their face today. So what is the way forward? I think we need more evidence and we need more relevant evidence. So I am a great proponent of filling in some of these evidence gaps with much better quality evidence. I've synthesized the evidence. The evidence is from small studies. None of these are effectiveness evaluations in real life. They are relatively small studies done in very controlled circumstances that we need to now complement with larger studies in the field. Of the areas that I've talked about, nutrition, gender equity, mental health, intergenerational impacts, we need stronger evidence to convince policymakers that this is not an expense. This is not a green climate fund that you're setting up right now that is you know, going to be a cost on the, ex of, on the exchequer. This is an investment for the future. 
and it is for the very geographies that do not have the capacity to do this on their own. And there has to, cost has to be a consideration. These have to be effective, low-cost interventions for them to reach at scale. There is no point in talking about trying to decarbonize the entire health system if countries don't have the capacity to buy solar panels and they don't manufacture them and they don't have the capacity to maintain them. So we need low-cost solutions that are feasible and that are possible to implement at scale. And we need it now. So time is of the essence. And I hope that all of you from this center of excellence here will join hands in advocating for everyone everywhere to be engaged in this issue. Thank you very much for your attention.